This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I have the same disclosure. Um, so I'm going to be talking about diagnosis and management of PAD in women. Um, and this is a very important topic because PAD is common in women and we see it particularly so in older women. And as our population survives longer with chronic disease, the prevalence of PAD uh, or the number of women in the United States with PAD is only going to increase. There's not a lot of data, um, but there are some data about uh, perform functional performance and also diagnosis. Um, and then also some data about outcomes after uh, infrainguinal revascularization. So I will be reviewing that today. And as a background, as, as you know, um, most people with PAD do not have the classic symptom of claudication. This is a lot like atypical angina or asymptomatic coronary ischemia. Um, asymptomatic PAD is common, and atypical leg symptoms in PAD are common. And these these um, atypical symptoms seem to be particularly prevalent in women. Um, one study that was conducted in Sweden uh, where 5,000 community dwelling men and women aged 60 to 90 were screened with the ABI found that asymptomatic PAD was significantly more common among women than in men. 12.6 uh, of their population had asymptomatic PAD versus 9% of the men who were screened. But in our WALKS cohort, an observational study in which PAD patients were identified from a vascular lab, we actually found no difference in asymptomatic PAD between men and women, but we did find that women had more atypical leg symptoms. And the most striking findings were that we found that men were more likely to walk through leg pain due to PAD. We call them leg pain carry on because they would just keep walking even with the pain. Um, and also we found that women were more likely to have exertional pain that sometimes occurred at rest but was not critical limb ischemia type of pain. Um, and these women were more likely to have diabetes or a history of neuropathy. So all of these other comorbidities that can affect the legs can contribute to leg symptoms in PAD, may confuse the picture with regard to diagnosis, and this phenomenon seems particularly common in women. Um, and we saw this also in the Women's Health and Aging Study, which was a study of 1,000 women aged 65 and older living in the Baltimore, Maryland area. Um, we found in this study that 66% of the approximately uh, one-third of the population with a low ABI were asymptomatic. In fact, there was no difference in, in lack of leg symptoms between women with PAD and those without PAD. So again, asymptomatic, PAD in a community dwelling population is pretty common among older women. Now, another interesting phenomenon that we found, um, again, is that the women who had a history of spinal stenosis or disc disease or knee or hip arthritis were more likely to have exertional leg symptoms. So here, at each ABI level, less than 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 0 0.9, normal ABI, um, those with history of other comorbidities affecting their back or their um, lower extremity joints were much more likely to have exertional leg symptoms than women without that history. So again, other comorbidities contribute to leg symptoms and can confuse the picture. 
And I just wanted to tell you that even though um, most of the women in the Women's Health and Aging Study with PAD were asymptomatic, they still had functional impairment, more so than those without PAD. These are all asymptomatic women in this slide, and here are the prevalences for um, difficulty walking a quarter mile or difficulty walking up 10 steps without rest, and lower ABI values shown in the yellow and the red bars were associated with greater difficulty with those tasks even though all of these women were asymptomatic. So with regard to leg symptoms, asymptomatic PAD is common in women, particularly in the community, and atypical leg symptoms are common in women and seem to be related to the presence of knee arthritis, hip arthritis, um, spinal stenosis, and disc disease. Um, what about gender differences in the ABI? And there are some. Um, this study is from the MESA cohort, which was a cohort of um, about 6,000 community-dwelling men and women without clinically evident cardiovascular disease when they entered the study. And here is the prevalence of various ABI categories in this community-dwelling cohort. Note that there was no difference in the, a low ABI, less than 0.9, between men shown here and women shown here, but what we found is that a uh, a 0.9 to 0.9, that is a borderline ABI, was significantly more common in women, about 11%, versus only 4% in the men. And also, what we call the low normal ABI, 1.0 to 1.09, was also much more common in women as compared to men. So women may have lower ABI values in the borderline and low normal range compared to men. And this may be significant. It shouldn't just be dismissed as, well, it's within the normal range, it doesn't matter. It probably does matter. And here are data from um, 50,000 men and women in the ABI collaboration project that was published in JAMA several years ago. Here are people with a normal ABI, 1.1 to 1.2. And even women in the circle, men in the triangles, those with um, low normal ABI and borderline low ABI had significantly higher mortality shown here on the y-axis compared to those with truly normal ABI values. So the lower the ABI, the higher the all-cause mortality. And even among men and women with low normal and borderline ABI values, you already begin to see that difference in mortality, increased mortality compared to people that have an ABI 1.1 to 1.2. And this has been demonstrated um, in other cohorts as well. Um, the San Luis Valley study was done by Bill Hyatt, um, looking at 403 community dwelling low risk individuals and comparing ABI values between men and women. And he found that mean ABI values were 0.07 lower in women compared to men. And he also found that height contributed to the ABI, a little, not a lot, but a little. Each 10 centimeter difference in height was associated with a one millimeter mercury difference in the acal pressure. And if that's surprising, um, it shouldn't be because systolic pressures increase with increasing distance from the heart. So um, the pressures at, this is why somebody without PAD has a normal ABI, the pressures at the ankle are higher than the pressure at the arm because the distance is greater. So if you're taller, then your pressure down here is going to be a little bit higher. But even after um, the San Luis Valley investigators adjusted for height, there still remained a difference in the average ABI between men and women. And this was also looked at in the MESA cohort where an um, analysis was done limited to people with low risk. They had no cardiovascular risk factors. They had no significant coronary calcium, um, no significant carotid IMT values. And in that very healthy group, women had a 0.02 lower ABI as compared to men. This suggests that there may be some intrinsic gender differences leading to a slightly lower ABI in women than in men. So again, uh, women may have lower ABI values. They do seem to have a higher prevalence of borderline, low normal um, ABI values as compared to men. Um, and some of it may be due to height, but not all of it appears to be due to height. And these slightly low ABI values may still have significant implications for cardiovascular events and functional performance. 
Um, it's also been demonstrated that women with PAD have greater um, impairment in walking performance than men and faster functional decline. Um, first, this shows you cross-sectional data. This is from our walks cohort again. Men, shown in red, had greater six-minute walk performance um, compared to women, even after we adjusted for height, and comorbidities, and other potential confounders. And also, um, uh, women had greater decline in functioning. And this is at about four-year follow-up um, for the outcome of mobility loss, becoming unable to walk for six minutes without stopping, or a 20% or greater decline in the six-minute walk performance. So women have greater functional impairment and faster functional decline compared to men. Now, some of this may be due to differences in strength. Here are our data from the WALKS cohort. Men, when we measured hip flexion, extension, knee flexion, extension, not surprisingly, were stronger in all of these um, measures as compared to women. And when we adjusted for these differences, some of the functional impairment differences between men and women went away. So um, it may be that some of this is an intrinsic gender um, characteristic, and it may be true that even among men and women without PAD, women um, don't do as well on the six-minute walk, for example, as compared to men. So um, in summary, um, some of the differences in functional impairment and decline may be due to intrinsic gender differences in muscle uh, strength between men and women. Now I'm going to move on to talking about um, outcomes after infrainguinal revascularization. And if you read the literature on this, um, there appears to be some controversy about whether men and women um, do similarly or whether women may do worse after infrainguinal revascularization. The largest group I could find um, was a cohort of over 5,000 men and women who underwent infrainguinal revascularization between 1966 and 1998. Um, and just at baseline and in general, um, uh, the women had a slightly higher prevalence of diabetes in some of the studies. This is true in other studies. The prevalence is similar between men and women. But women tend to be older. Women with PAD tend to be older than men with PAD. Um, and in this particular cohort, women were less likely to have a smoking history. And in this cohort, about a third of the procedures were performed in women as compared to men. And that seemed consistent with other cohorts that had been published. Um, so also of interest is that women were less likely to have revascularization for claudication than men um, and also were more likely to have revascularization due to an ulcer or rest pain or other evidence of critical limb ischemia. Overall, though, the outcomes were not significantly different between men and women in this very large cohort. Operative mortality was similar, um, even though the women were a little bit older than the men. Um, the complications were similar between men and women. The only difference was that women had a slightly higher wound infection, 4% versus 2.9. I'm not sure this is clinically significant. Given the size of the cohort, it was statistically significant. So there doesn't seem to be much difference. And then I thought, well, you know, these were procedures that were done between the 1960s and the end of the 20th century. So maybe, I'm sh obviously, things have changed. So I was able to find another um, cohort, a pretty large cohort of 1,300 patients going, undergoing 1,500 procedures that was just published in 2012, a much more recent um, the time period, and still there were no differences. This is focusing mainly on patency rates, but also survival and limb salvage were really not different between men and women. So women appear to have similar outcomes after infrainguinal revascularization as compared to men. Um, I want to speak briefly about estrogen replacement therapy and PAD. As we all know, um, in the late 20th century, there was the thinking that um, estrogen was beneficial for protecting against cardiovascular disease in women, and, um, but we've had some trials since then that suggest this may not be the case. This slide summarizes data from the HERS trial, which was a trial of nearly 3,000 women with a history of coronary heart disease who were followed um, in HERS for about four years and in HERS two for about three additional years. Um, at seven-year follow-up, these 3,000 women, um, there was no difference in lower extremity PAD outcomes between women 
who were randomized to estrogen plus progesterone versus those randomized to placebo. So the, the hormone replacement therapy was not protective, um, not statistically significant um, difference in those outcomes. And then the Women's Health Initiative, a trial we're all familiar of, of 10,000 women. Um, and th these are the data from the women who had had hysterectomies, and they were randomized to either estrogen therapy alone versus placebo. This is seven-year follow-up. And here you can see um, the entire cohort total peripheral arterial disease outcomes at seven-year follow-up. No significant difference in those randomized to estrogen versus placebo. Um, the point estimate 1.3, almost statistically significant um, in suggesting a potential harm, but overall um, the conclusion was there's no benefit, certainly, and um, no statistically significant harm. So what about medical management of PAD in women? I am not aware of any data that specifically um, discusses this separately in women. Um, for protecting against cardiovascular events, all PAD patients should be treated with statins, antiplatelet therapy, be helped to quit smoking, and their blood pressure should be controlled. Um, and I'm not aware of any data suggesting that these therapies are any more or less effective in women as compared to men. Um, with regard to improving performance and preventing functional decline, we've talked about exercise this morning. Um, Solazazam, pentoxifylin are FDA approved for claudication, and then Ramipril recently um, has suggested it have some benefit. Um, and I'm not aware of any data showing that these work differently in men and women. I can tell you that we have looked at our exercise data for both our supervised exercise intervention trial and now our goals home-based intervention trial, and we don't see a difference between men and women. They both benefit. Um, so I, I don't think that in 2013 there's any reason to believe that women would not benefit similarly from these therapies. Um, so in conclusion, w um, PAD in women really is common, and as we continue to see men and women living longer with, with chronic disease, um, there will just be more and more women who have PAD. Um, they're often asymptomatic or with atypical symptoms. They do have greater functional decline as compared to men. Um, and uh, it's, there's no clear difference that the available interventions that we have work differently between men and women. Thank you.